Good morning um, and welcome to GSV's virtual summit. Um, our, uh, uh, following up on our success in April, we decided to extend this in for a few sessions here in May. Uh, I'm Deborah Quazzo, the um, managing partner of GSV Ventures and the co-founder of the ASU GSV Summit. And we're thrilled to have everyone here today. Um, it's my incredible pleasure. There he is coming live. I could have put my Jacksonville background in the background of my my Zoom, Alberto. I, uh, I've got that in my repertoire so somewhere here. Um, my picture actually is from Jacksonville, though, I will note. Um, we are uh, incredibly uh, honored to have Alberto Carvalho um, here with us this morning to be able to do a fireside chat. Alberto is um, a, a pretty remarkable uh, figure. And I actually thought I'd start with his personal story in a time when um, we, uh, I think, could use some some inspiration, uh, and uh, um, uh, and hear, hearing kind of how how he got to where he got to, I think, helps that. Um, Alberto grew up in Portugal. He was the son of hardworking parents of modest means. Uh, as I understand, you were you were one only one of your six siblings to graduate from high school. You came to the United States undocumented, worked your way up uh, in this country through hourly jobs. Obviously, experienced homelessness along the way obviously um, became a citizen, got to college, and ultimately you became a physics, chemistry, and calculus teacher in Miami. You then yeah, had a series of promotions, assistant, associate or assistant superintendent, and then in 2008, you were, you were appointed superintendent of Miami-Dade. Um, and aside from New York trying to steal you once, you have had a, very, a notably long and important um, tenure there. Uh, it is the fourth largest district in the country. Uh, it is 91% students of color, 350,000 roughly total students, 73% of which are on free and reduced lunch. Alberto has won things like Superintendent of the Year, um, leadership around technology, and he's really, he and his leadership team, his broad leadership team of teachers and administrators have really engineered um, a whole district turnaround. Um, so I thought with the backdrop, Alberto, of your life story, I actually just might want to uh, wait into my first question was really around empathy, um, because given where you came from, um, you were able to bring to bear empathy for your students, your teachers, and your administrative leadership, your teacher leadership, and your administrative leadership. It's actually National Mental Health Month, as you well know. I actually read a blog that your associate superintendent uh, posted a couple days ago. Uh, COVID has obviously exacerbated anxieties and mental health issues of all forms, especially for our most vulnerable students. Um, Miami-Dade has been a leader in implementing district-wide mental health programs, uh, including leverage te leveraging technology like AR and VR um, to address uh, these issues. And I'd love to have you, if you wouldn't mind, speak to, um, speak to this and how you and your leadership team and, and school leaders have been addressing the mental health needs of students and, and for that matter, of everyone in the district during this COVID crisis. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, particularly to you, Deborah. It's great to see you once again uh, and to the GSV community. Uh, you know, uh, our warm uh, greetings to all of you from sunny Miami. Uh, as you correctly said, uh, we, we began paying close attention, being very deliberate in terms of uh, augmenting uh, our presence in the social, emotional, and mental um, health and well-being space, uh, not only for our students, but for their parents as well as our workforce, well before Parkland, but certainly uh, after Parkland, um, with uh, state revenues uh, being appropriated, we uh, dramatically ramped up uh, our presence in that space, uh, creating the first mental health department in the entire school uh, state of Florida uh, with over 60 uh, mental health professionals, developing new protocols uh, through the early identification of issues, crisis, anxiety, fear, bullying, what have you, uh, in schools, uh, the ability to connect. And this, by the way, is over and above the school psychologists, the social workers, and the counselors, the trust counselors included, but then being able to connect those children, their families, to uh, third-party providers outside of the school system for there to be a continuum of services that expands beyond the schoolhouse. Uh, certainly uh, with the advent of COVID-19 and this crisis, we recognized yet again that there were uh, new uh, pressures both on students, uh, parents, and staff. Therefore, we pivoted uh, significantly to bring these resources now utilizing uh, the assets, the platforms we have, uh, whether we're talking about virtual support, 
uh, the possibility for chat rooms for uh, peer-to-peer mentoring to deal with stress and anxiety, uh, the development of very successful hotlines uh, that parents, children, and employees can call in and real-time be connected with a professional who can specifically deal with the issue, but then also refer them uh, to a long-term provider. So I believe we pivoted uh, twice uh, during just a couple of years in terms of augmenting uh, the provision of social and emotional support. It is something we teach uh, in our schools, uh, right alongside mindfulness, right alongside curriculum programs uh, recommended to us by the American Psychiatric uh, Association and many others, empowering particularly the youth uh, with being active members in a school community and the recognition of stress, anxiety, trouble behavior on the part of other students, and then being able to report it safely, sometimes confidentially, but then also being a voice as a peer support member to the student community. It's fantastic. So would you anticipate um, that you would leave the, the, that in your initiatives there at that scale post COVID? You know, that's a, that's a fantastic question. I anticipate, actually I predict, not only for Miami Dave, but for the entire country, that post COVID-19, a lot of the platform systems that have been created, the shift from traditional teaching and learning, uh, and along that goes psychological, mental, social, and emotional support, now to a virtual environment where these services can be accessed 24 seven, anytime, anywhere. I predict that they will continue, uh, not only here in Miami-Dade, but across the country. Look, we opened a powerful curtain that demonstrated that uh, teaching and learning uh, does not necessarily have to be confined to bricks and mortar environments. And uh, one powerful uh, participant in this process has been the parent, who for weeks now is home with a child and has a front row seat to what's happening in terms of the education children are getting. Uh, parents are not going to let go of that sense of empowerment and day-to-day -day monitoring of events. So yes, everything will shift. Uh, and one of the shifts will be the continuance of the availability of these services, indispensable essential services, not only in a traditional way when conditions allow, but also in novel virtual ways uh, that we were forced to migrate to. That was not the case in Miami. We already had many choice programs that utilize 21st century technology, but as a nation, we were forced to migrate there. To think that now when the crisis is lifted, we're gonna go back to the old normal is quite frankly uh, uh, not uh, a realistic scenario. There will be a new normal that takes full advantage of everything that has been enabled since the start of this crisis. And that, by the way, is a good thing. I really hope you're right, because that, yeah, as we think about it, this uh, our framing BC to AD, which is before Corona to after disease. And, um, it, you know, I, I, I love your vision and I hope you're dead right, because uh, because I think the, the what has happened has been um, has been transformative in many ways, not always successful, but um, uh, but but transformative in many, many positive ways. So that actually, you give me the perfect segue. So the, the inspiration for, you know, my reach out actually came from an interview I did with Jeb Bush um, a couple of weeks ago on our series and where he really cited the seamless move from physical to digital or remote learning in Miami-Dade. Um, and, you know, I'd love you to, you know, you just obviously, you, you just sort of um, brushed over it, but love you to talk about it. I mean, how, how was it that you all, what had you done in terms of preparedness? Um, uh -huh. You know, how much hardware was distributed? How did you deal with Wi-Fi access? Obviously that's been a big issue all over the country. Um, and then kind of any other thoughts you might have for now, you know, district and, and school leaders around the country. And, and just a particular adjunct to that, you guys have gotten 92% attendance as I understand it. And that also appears to be a large issue for some. Um, so love to hear you talk about that too, uh, Ed, you know. Sure. So let me, uh, let me uh, begin by saying we currently have 100% connectivity. That means student connectivity. Uh, 92 to 93 percent daily student attendance. We distributed an excess of 119,000 personal devices. And is that to, attendance actually higher than what you would get in a physical setting? Uh, comparable? It, it's, it's, it's comparable 
uh, about 1% off a traditional school day attendance, which is quite, quite remarkable. Yep. Um, 11,000 hotspots, a partnership with Comcast. We were the first district to, uh, to ask Comcast Xfinity uh, to deploy resources to address the digital deserts that exist in certain zip codes. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I have to tell you, we began the planning to be where we are today, not to respond to COVID-19, but to be where we are today because we anticipated that at some point in the future, this day would come. And we began this journey back in 2012 when we passed a massive $1.2 billion bond referendum, 250 million of which was earmarked for technology uh, to expand bandwidth, uh, to create universal ubiquitous Wi-Fi in all of our schools with a signal strength that extended beyond the school uh, walls uh, to make decisions regarding grade level and standards aligned digital content that we have curated through purchase, but also developed here in Miami-Dade. Making decisions regarding platforms, establishing training on Microsoft Teams and Zoom with great partnerships with Microsoft. So we began making those investments. And of course, I don't believe in buying personal devices uh, through bond money. You are in essence, uh, uh, you know, taking a mortgage out for 30 years for a device whose life cycle is three years. But uh, we use different finance mechanisms to then acquire uh, through a lease purchase uh, model, hundreds of thousands of devices. So here's the, what happened. Uh, uh, in January. We did not wait for the federal government or state government to tell us that COVID-19 could be a disruptive force in Miami. I placed COVID-19 coronavirus on my leadership meeting agenda in January. And we put on the board, worst case scenario, you shut down 520 schools because this is not a matter of if, but when will it impact us and to what extent. So let's start with the worst case scenario. Shut down 520 schools, uh, have 355,000 pre-K-12 kids at home, in addition to 150,000 adult and technical learners that receive services through us, in addition to 48,000 employees. At a time when the economy comes to a standstill, what do we do? Well, we were lucky uh, because we began our planning for the shutdown in January. By the time February uh, rolled around, we were already having, and certainly into March, conversations even with unions about the protocols for accountability during virtual teaching. So when we switched off traditional teaching and activated uh, distance learning, we had protocols in place. The teachers and the students had an ease of transitioning uh, to this environment because the assets they were using at home, the only thing that changed was geography. The assets they were using at home were the assets that they were using in the classroom. The applications were the same. Now they were just doing it from a different geography. With that said, intensive professional development uh, to guarantee smooth transition, 100% uh, uh, attendance by teachers on that professional development, activation of support lines, telephonic lines, email lines for student support, teacher support, technical support, and the development, and this I think is one of the coolest things, a virtual parent academy to empower parents with a skill set to help students navigate uh, this uh, schooling at home, which is different than homeschooling. That is why, not devoid of challenges or problems, but that is why we are where we are, I think ahead of the curve, not having faltered in many ways, unfortunately, like many other examples that we've seen uh, across the country. So it was preparation that goes back to 2012 intensified by current conditions. We're now at a point where we're examining contingency plans for the return that look at 10 to 12 different options. And that too is not a bad thing. We want to empower, we wanna see and recognize an opportunity in the middle of this crisis. And that for me is now leveraging the knowledge we have, the access and the equity that we have built to meet students where they are and teach them 24 seven, anytime, anywhere. So I, I, I want to string a little along. I love this parent empowerment theme. Um, so important because to me, I think what's fascinating is we're calling it remote learning. The reality is, you know, high income districts 
have students learning at home all the time, right? They've got devices, they've got, you know, software, they've got whatever that they can, they can afford and, and students spend more time at home than they do actually in the, in the literal, in the literal school building. So do you, so to me, this is, yeah, it's remote, but you're remote. So my hope is that one of the, the thing, one of the practices that comes to play in, in back to parent empowerment is that for, for low income families or middle income families that were not typically using the home as a place of learning on a you know continuous basis, whether it was lack of Wi-Fi or lack of devices or lack of um, you know parental um, instruction of you know guidance on how to do it, that this that post COVID in the um, yeah. AD world that we begin to see a lot more at home activity for students who hadn't you know hadn't had that um, you know hadn't had that muscle built previously. Does that make yeah. sense to you? It makes sense to me. Look, let's recognize one thing. Access is the enabler of equity and equity ultimately in the educational environment uh, is the precursor to equal opportunity as far as high quality learning. So if you do not have access, and I'm talking about both parent and student, because it's not lost to us, the yep. day the child has that device at home with full connectivity, uh, we send it home with a parent portal and a student portal. So we now have a two-way gateway of access, communication, feedback, influence to parents as well as students. And so I think we are empowering parents. I've always talked about uh, this dynamic of school systems and parents following the, you know, the law of economics, supply and demand. You're absolutely right. You described very well the, the demand-sided parenting. They have everything. They have the time, the resources, the connectivity, right? The content, the experience. But we have a lot of supply-sided parents. They supply children with very few questions asked. I want to turn those supply-sided parents into demand-sided parents because now they have the tools. I want them to push us as much as possible. But you're absolutely right. This is a new reality that we're not going to back away from as conditions improve, because I think we now have a direct pipeline of information, feedback, influence uh, to every single child's home. So we are addressing both the needs of children, but also listening carefully, helping parents, but also accepting their feedback. Just understand the possibility of the, of the parental uh, data analytics that we may be able to obtain in a in, in in the process of trying to help kids. This is powerful, and I think amidst this crisis, again, it's an opportunity that has emerged—an opportunity that the just just doesn't pop to the surface. You go and find it, and uh, we've been yeah. deliberate in terms of finding these opportunities amidst the crisis. Okay, so I, we have you know likely a lot of ed tech entrepreneurs in the audience, and so I'd like to maybe take take advantage of this moment to actually. Um, let you gen, potentially gin up an idea for someone to take the ball and run with. You've been, you've been a tech savvy superintendent from the very beginning. Um, clearly, the way you have have it's not the you've not viewed ed tech as a silver bullet, but you've you've seen it as a way to drive equity and access. That you know, there's no better poster child situation for it than where, where we are right now. You started I Prep Academy, which is a very you know non traditional school, and I'll come back to that if we have some time. Um, you were named, you know, tech savvy, 10 top tech savvy superintendents of the year. And you've, you've um, anyway, been very active in this area. If you stood back right now and, and thought about pain points within the district, which would include the, you know, parent at home and in the, in schools, what area would you, would you suggest um, for entrepreneurs that could and should be addressed by, by um, smart, energetic uh, founders who might be able to think of a great solution to a big district pain point? So I would ask, uh, love the question. I would ask for help on two levels. One may seem non-traditional, I'll start with that one. Help me with advocacy at state level and federal level to finally decouple. Number one, dramatically change FCC rules uh, that uh, dictate upon E-rate how funds to support technology uh, can be used in districts. Liberalize it, allow innovation, because right now uh, the FCC rules that dictate over E-rate uh, which helps a lot of districts utilize technology money, uh, are very restrictive, archaic, decadent. Secondly, help me decouple uh, public education funding from mandated seed time. It's insane. Come on, we're experiencing this now uh, under this crisis. 
we need to be able to have public education delivered in the way that meets children where they are in terms of pro uh, their proficiency, their performance, their socioeconomic status, their geography, where they reside in school or out of school through blended and hybrid uh, models. Now, specific to uh, the tech world, uh, look, I I'm looking for collaboration. I'm looking for a joint venture where true personalized adaptive, paying close attention to special needs students and English language learners, personalized adaptive platforms and content are delivered on the basis of the data that we possess and we are a data rich district. You know, data is our, our DNA, it's our, our, our super strength, utilizing our data, building a system that recognizing that a lot of parents may opt for a blended learning environment, a hybrid model, or altogether outside of the school for a prolonged period of time. Personalized adaptive models utilizing our data that exactly prescribe for the child, not only the best modality of learning, but the pace, the guide, and the excitement that motivates them periodically with the necessary feedback of data performance to us, not relying on monthly or quarterly assessments, but organic assessment that the student doesn't even perceive is embedded assessment, assessment, but generates data. We call it embedded, it, invisible assessment. Exactly. Fantastic. Okay, I could talk to you for two hours. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're a little bit over our time. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership and your service. I am uh, very hopeful that there will be national collaborations around uh, creating plans like the one that ones that you have built in Miami-Dade. And we so appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Alberto. Deborah, thank you so much and uh, best of luck. And uh, let's see through this. There will be an end in sight just at the end of this, uh, this cycle. Let's be better for it if we're smart enough. Thank you. Bravo. Agree. Thank you.